not to be like the world and not to be like the great majority of American Christians, but to be like Jesus Christ. I don't know why you're clapping. I'm talking about you. What's wrong with you people? I'm serious. You can't say amen. You ought to say ouch. Welcome to the Tulips and Honey Show, where Lauren interviews authors and engages leading reform thinkers and theologians, all to see the Lord's name glorified, his church edified, his people encouraged, and the lost reached with the gospel of Jesus. Now for your host, Lauren. Hey, right, humblebees. Welcome back to Tulips and Honey. I am your host, Lauren Herford, and today I have two very special guests I am very excited to have on. These wonderful Sisters in Christ wrote a fantastic book, which I will be doing a, uh, a blah, 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 I forgot the word, what is it, um, review. There will be a review of their fantastic book on my blog, which should be out by the time this episode comes out. So I'm going to link to that review down below so you guys can read what I thought about this fantastic book. The book, of course, is called When Words Matter Most, and it was written by Cheryl Marshall and Caroline Neuheiser. And we practiced those names beforehand, so so I hopefully still pronounce them right. Ladies, thank you so much for joining me on the program. Thank, thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you, Lauren. Absolutely. It's definitely my privilege. I am super excited to talk to you. All of my lady listeners know, and of course, uh, this is actually, I have a weird audience. I have a I have an almost perfect 50-50 audience. So it's actually why I bring men on if I want to uh, teach on like heavy theology. I usually bring guys on because there's a weird there's a weird uh, uh, allotment of, of um, listeners. But anyways, uh, the men all know, and they're probably tired of hearing it, but the women are definitely tired of hearing it, that there is so much dribble out there whenever it comes to... Um, uh, books that are written and aimed towards women because a lot of them are emotionally um, heavy or fluffy in light and theology or both emotional and light and theology, which is a horrible mixture. And it's very frustrating as women for us to want to seek to better learn theology. We want to read one another's stuff. I know a lot of women reach out to me each week and they're like, do you have any women who are actually teaching theologically and they're not going to slip or or have any kind of, um, you know, uh, what we call a Francis Chan moment. So that's why I was so excited to read you ladies books because there's very few that I can point to and even fewer that I can point to that were written by women who are still alive today. So, I mean, that's all doubly <laughs> exciting. You know, you can always count on the people who have already gone on to glory because we know they won't, they won't backslide because they're, they're already done. But you ladies did a fantastic job. I'm so thankful that you guys stay true to scripture, theologically sound. You do have the appropriate amount of personal stories, things people have gone through with the mixture of scripture and application. And this is something that that I, I'm constantly seeking out whenever I'm reading books. I don't want it to just be all personal, but also if it's just got nothing in it for application, it can be hard for us to understand how to apply these to our daily lives. One of the one of the chapters you actually get into like that specifically, where you say scripture is um, it, it's per, you're like we we have everything we need in scripture, even if we're talking about something that scripture doesn't purposefully mention, it tells us how to handle those things. So you you just you did a fantastic job. So I just really want to thank you both before we even get started on your testimonies. Thank you for saying so true to scripture and working on this book. Books are hard, and publishing books are is even harder. So you ladies are wonderful. Thank you for doing that. And and I'm, I'm done. I'm sorry, embarrassing you guys, because um, I, I have to fangirl a little bit because it's that exciting. Like, there's just so few books out there like this dealing with such an important topic for, for us as women as well. So before we get started on all of that, obviously, I, I mean, I've jammered on for like two minutes. Sorry. Um, but <laughs> maybe I can edit some of that out. I don't know. Either way, if, we, if you wonderful ladies can start with your testimonies, that would be fantastic. It's usually where I like to start with uh, new folks coming on the program. So I'll start because I'm older than Cheryl. <laughs> <laughs> My testimony starts earlier than hers. Um, I grew up in a Christian home, but found that I didn't know truth. Even though I was exposed to truth, it hadn't sunk in until I was in college. So I went to Baylor University and uh, my husband was the one who started teaching me about the doctrines of grace. And that just helped everything come together. And especially I had to get over the total depravity Mm -hmm. since I was a good girl and conformist and all this. But when my husband told me this before we were married, we were dating. Wow. (laughs) When he told me about total depravity, I fought and argued with him for the longest time. And then I just saw the gospel. I saw the need for Christ. It just changed everything. My life was never the same after. That. Wow. Praise God for your husband to do that. Even like while you're dating is, is very impressive. That's really, really neat. Very cool. Cheryl, how about you? Well, 
Well, I actually became a believer at a very young age. The Lord saved me when I was probably five or six years old. I grew up in a Christian home and my parents took me to church. And uh, I guess when I was around five, I started asking a lot of questions and my parents would speak with me about that, answer those questions. And my mother had a book called Leading Little Ones to God that she would read to me and to my sister. And I still remember a particular day when uh, I was in the living room with my mother and sitting on the living room floor. And I still remember the light streaming in through the window. That day, we just had a longer conversation and I um, asked the Lord to save me. And he was faithful, I believe, to do that at that time. And I do still remember having the childlike faith of I am a sinner. Jesus died on the cross for my sin and I need him to be forgiven in order to be forgiven. And of course, that's a five or six year old little mind, little soul. Uh, but I believe that's when the Lord worked my heart. And uh, I grew up and I don't remember a whole lot during those early years. But when I was in junior high, a woman began discipling me. And that was when a lot of the, a lot of the ideas and a lot of, a lot more understanding came together. And you know, been through a lot of trials, ups and downs, and yet the Lord has always been faithful and gracious. And and I am so thankful for that. Oh, praise God. This is why I love this question, and that's why I always start with it because everybody has these unique testimonies. And so sometimes I get people and and they'll send me messages and they'll they'll say, listen, I don't have that bam moment that that I talk about in my testimony, and it makes them uncomfortable. If somebody you know hears these people who are like I was shooting. Drugs, drugs in my eyeball and then I got saved. That sounds, you know, it sounds really profound, but I I mean, speaking just from somebody who who did have to go through quite a lot of sin and idolatry, I would have rather have, you, you know, your testimony. And definitely as a mom, it's super encouraging to hear both of these, both of your testimonies. One, hearing that if your child is really showing fruit, that you don't have to, like, like Justin Peter's wonderful book uh, describes, you don't have to discourage that. You don't have to say, no, absolutely, there's no way you're saved. That's actually something that God can do. I mean, he's sovereign, he can do whatever he wants. And he does do whatever he wants on heaven and on earth. But, and then you have Caroline's testimony where if you're a parent whose child has, you know, not had that moment, not had that salvation, that you don't have to lose hope and you can continue to pray and you continue to thank God for all of the different ways that he's leading your your family. So it's encouraging to me on both aspects. And it's definitely why I love to ask this question, because I don't like to hear people, you know, reaching out to me and being like, my testimony is boring. No, there is nothing boring about the fact that God has completely and totally changed your heart and made you into a new person, irregardless of when that happened. And for you, Cheryl, to have it happen at a young age and still be able to point to like moments where, where God was faithful is helpful for those folks. Because there are folks out there and they are discouraged <laughs> quite quite frankly that's the only people i hear from and they're discouraged and worried about their assurance which is uh really only simply because they hear the extreme testimonies everybody likes to hear everybody likes to hear the extreme testimonies but i think irregardless it's just amazing it's amazing what god does and, and that any of us are ever saved so that's great i'm so thankful for both of you sharing that and and really getting into especially like depravity that's so fun carolyn so many people are like depravity i'm a good person and then and then god is like <laughs> well he doesn't really say that because god's not speaking anymore today just just Board, we're just gonna put that out there. That's I wasn't saying that God's speaking. Um, so he speaks to us through his word. How did you two wonderful ladies meet? Uh, my husband was a pastor in Escondido, California for 26 years and is very near Westminster Seminary in California. It's the same city. And we would often get students come in as they were studying at the seminary and they wanted to worship with us because we are Reformed Baptists. So Baptist students tended to come to our church. So that's how Cheryl and I met. Right. So Cheryl, you had a little known pastor though, right? Like you grew up with a pastor who was not very well known. Um, probably yeah. not many people will know his name. Right. So not many may have heard of him. His name's John MacArthur. <laughs> um, you know, it's a very large church, a very large church. So I think I met him once wow. in those many years, but uh, I think I was eight years old when my parents said, uh, moved us over to that church. And interestingly, it's because the pastor at the church we were at, the little Baptist church we were at, he started teaching some false doctrine. And my parents were concerned that my sister and I would be influenced by that. So even though that was had been the family church, they broke those ties. And uh, we had some other family members who are at Grace Community Church. And that's where we went. And again, speaking to mothers, as you said, uh, you know, mothers hearing about children being saved, as you mentioned a moment ago, I, I do want to say this, it is so valuable. I look back and it's so valuable that I was in a church from a young age where I was being taught the word of God. Mm. Now that I'm older, I really see the benefit of that. And so um, just as an encouragement to moms, if you're in a place where your kids are getting that, thank the Lord and and um, don't despise the day of small things because God will use that in their lives. Yeah, absolutely. I really, I, I might I might edit this out, but just, just to mention it, we had, uh, we, we travel for my husband's work. So every six months to a year, we, we you know, go somewhere different. But we try to make it home in between, or we did before like the COVID stuff happened. Since my husband works at the hospital, we're kind of encouraged strongly not to leave the state. But um, we had a home church when we, when we got saved back in 2015 and we were traveling 
and we, we found this wonderful little church and they were teaching, you know, great solid theology. And my daughter was so encouraged and so excited and she'd bring her little notebook and, and then we'd travel and we'd find, you know, a nice church. And then we'd, we'd, we'd come back home to our home church six months later and it had completely apostatized and, and they were like speaking in tongues and prophesying. And, um, it, it was kind of, it was actually kind of frightening because I, I, I spent a lot of time in the word of faith and we thought we had gotten out of it. And my, my, my sweet little daughter is there with her notebook and she's going, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to write all of this. All of this is wrong. I'm going to write. And I was like, no, because people are looking over your shoulder right now, please. <laughs> but it was, it was a great learning, at least opportunity for, for all of us to go home and, and discuss the issues and have to figure out, you know, theologically, since we were newer believers at the time. But I did, I just wanted to mention that because that that mm-hmm. reminded me of, of how she responded yes. to that. It is it is at least a blessing for for little ones to have enough understanding to put some pieces like that together and, and then to have a good solid church that especially right now, while so many people are arguing about whether or not we should even be in church or not. I mean, that's got to be discouraging for moms. And, and I'm glad that you mentioned that. And we really do want to encourage moms to, like you said, be, be grateful for all those little moments. We don't have very many mm-hmm. of them. My, my daughter is 11 and she's, she's taller than me now. And it's really, it's it, it hurt, really, really hurts that she they grow up fast. Yeah, she kisses my forehead and then laughs hysterically. She's so short, mommy. Okay. Well, anyways, <laughs> why why did you wonderful ladies decide to write this book? When when you guys you met, y'all obviously are um good good friends, but a lot of good friends maybe don't have the ability to um work so closely because writing a book is it is it's not just a lot of work, but that's really a personal like you're putting yourself out there in a way that you know, easy for people to maybe be like, oh, I don't like this book and, and that can hurt and all that stuff. So how did you ladies decide to write this book together? And how did you decide on this topic? Well, first of all, um, after Caroline and I met 20 something years ago, um, we ended up going different directions. We moved to Kentucky, the Texas, she's now in North Carolina. And so for the most part, we kept in touch with Christmas cards. Our, our husbands are friendly with one another. So they would talk. And so I was knew where she was and what she was doing. Um, so it's not like we have always been the best of buds or something like that. Um, but that is, I'm very thankful for this time because I've been able to um, strengthen this friendship with her over the last couple of years. But a few years ago, I was teaching a women's Bible study or women's Sunday school, actually Fundamentals of the Faith by John MacArthur. And I taught a few semesters of that. And every semester I would ask the ladies in the room um, on the first day, you know, introduce yourselves, what's your name, tell something about yourself um, and why are you taking the class? And so often there'd be a woman who would say, I'm, I'm here because I want to learn the Bible better so that I can share it with fill in the blank. And she would mention like my sister who's struggling spiritually or my my cousin or my friend, but it was often someone who was struggling in some way and they wanted to be able to share God's word with them and apply it, help them apply it to their lives. And so that sort of stuck in the back of my mind. And then one day at church, a woman stopped me in the hall and her daughter had recently had a miscarriage. And the woman asked me, she said, uh, my daughter is, or my daughter-in-law is so terrified that um, she will lose another their baby if she becomes pregnant again. So where can I take her in the scriptures to encourage her? And so we just stepped aside there in the hall and talked about it and looked at the word of God together. And um, I helped answer that question. We talked it through and she went on her way. And as she walked away, I thought to myself, wow, this is a woman who has been in the church for years Mm -hmm. and she is in a well-taught church. And yet at a moment like this, she still feels uncertain about what to say to her loved one and how to say it. And that really got me thinking um, about this whole topic of speaking the truth with grace to those you love according to their need. And honestly, I was afraid to write a book by myself. I had never done this before. <laughs> this is like, I've never done anything like this. And I thought, okay, who who would do this with me? Well, the only person that came to mind was Caroline, not because she's written a book before, she hadn't done this either, but because I knew that this is how she lived. And I knew that if I did this with Caroline, she would bring a wealth of experience and wisdom to the project that I really wanted it to have. So I got hold of her and the rest is history. <laughs> What about you, Carolyn? What did you think whenever she contacted you and was like, let's write a book? Uh, I didn't know at the time what a talented author Cheryl is, which I learned. But um, my part is training women because I'm involved in biblical counseling. And I started giving talks at conferences about how women need to care for one another and use scripture with each other because I was getting so many people coming in for counseling who just really needed discipleship. They could have used somebody in their church, an older woman or a loving friend to talk to instead of coming into 
me, a, a stranger. So that, that was my passion. And so when Cheryl said yes, I thought, okay. And I had some materials. And as Cheryl said, I had cases to talk about and some examples of what really is needed to be said and done for others. Yeah, those examples are really helpful. Like I mentioned at the beginning, it's it's so interesting to me too, to, to listen to you ladies talk about this because the experience is so, it, it's so different being in um, and, and getting to fellowship and, and talk with you ladies, being that y'all are sound and your book is such a different experience. I spent like 14 years in the word of faith movement where when when I had a very painful miscarriage, I didn't tell anybody because I already knew what I was going to be told. And they, and they may have even given me a scripture, but it would have been taken out of context. And then I would have been uh, told that it was my lack of faith that caused that to happen. And so I was either sinning or I wasn't showing enough faith. And so it was, you, you were afraid. You were afraid to talk to women about what you were going through physically. And so there was a, a, there, there was a little bit of a, of a readjustment for me whenever I got saved and we started going to solid churches where I had to remember that these women were not there to bite my head off. And it was going to be okay if I just said, "Hey, you know what? I have a cold." Nobody would say, "Don't, don't proclaim that cold like before," which was all we would ever hear. So it did take a little bit of adjustment, but it's important too that that these kind of books get written because the majority of professing Christianity right now is con- well, not not everybody, but a good deal of them are confused about God's sovereignty whenever it comes to sickness or trials or tribulations. And for me, whenever I got saved, that was a huge relief to look at and say, "Okay, God is sovereign." So whenever these things happen, we haven't been able to have more children, but we have the one, and I can glorify God for that. And I can be really thankful that I even have one more than what I deserve because what I deserve is hell. So I don't even deserve the happy family that he's given me so graciously or the salvation or any of that stuff. That was such a relief. And that's what your book is like. Your book is like reliving that moment of relief where you are throughout each chapter describing the biblically sound way to approach these different, and there's, there's two parts of it too. So uh, maybe we can get into that a little bit in a minute, but the, the way that the book is set up, every chapter has something that you're going to be able to take and apply to not only your own personal growth, but also how we how we do love one another, because unfortunately there is a lot of backbiting, uh, even in some of the solid churches. I have ladies reach out to me and say, my, my women's ministry is reading a Beth Moore book. What do I do? And I'm like, I, I, I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> uh, do you have a husband that could talk to the pastor? Or what, you know, but it, it's sad to see a lot of ladies reach out to me. And I've had this conversation with Brooke Bart, a, a mutual, a mutual friend and, and even Aaron Coates about how often these women are reaching out. And I don't have the answers to that. Uh, your, your book is the answer. This is how we have to teach. We, we have to be teaching one another, older women like you mentioned, should be teaching the younger women. And in that we all grow so that the next person who comes along will have that, that same discipleship. And, and it hopefully can create a pattern, but we, we need more books like this. We really do need this, this, uh, this help. This, this is just a fantastic book for helping with all of these, all of these little issues. I can't even tell, like begin to tell you. I, so I have my, my readers and listeners and viewers already know this, but I have insomnia. I can't begin to tell you how many times people will reach out to me and be like, listen, what you need to do is sniff lavender. That's not helpful. Cause I haven't slept in seven days. I don't want to, I don't want to sniff lavender. I can't, I can't even see straight right now. Um, it's not helpful. But but the encouragement that you recommend in this book and that is all throughout the book, that is helpful. That is how we can help one another rather than telling one another to, to do yoga or sniff lavender. But um, just to get back to, to the actual topic, because I squirreled there a minute, sorry. Uh, what, what actually was your favorite part about writing this book and what was the most difficult part? Want to go for it, Caroline? Go for okay. It. My favorite part was take, seeing Cheryl being able to take my ideas and illustrations, examples, scriptures, and turn it into a thing of beauty. Yeah. She was really talented and um, to make things flow and connect with each other, just taking a mishmash of things and making a work of art out of it. That was my favorite part. But the hardest part, I was recently looking over uh, what our chapters and we had a chapter on uh, the greater grace, which is really a systematic theology. Yeah. And I was looking over all the different ways we tried to express justification. Like you're in a courtroom and the judge pronounces you and we didn't know what to say because it wasn't not guilty because we are guilty right. still, but we had, we had a savior. So my husband made a note, like probably need to not say not guilty, but we went back and forth. Remember Cheryl? Yes. Yeah. I do. How do we say this? And we ended up with the judge pronounces us justified. Oh, I love it. <laughs> That's our cop out there. Just justified. There it is. Make it plain right there. It shows you it. how really we wanted to be accurate. We wanted to be really careful in what we said. Yeah. Because we didn't know yes. who our readers would be. Right. And they're going to be women, hopefully, from all different stripes. So we wanted to yeah. be very careful. And so we, we sweated over some things like that. And I'm glad you did. I really am. Yeah. Clarification is so important. So my favorite um, part, well, I, I was thinking about this because I knew you were going to be asking the question. So I, mm-hmm. I'm glad I knew ahead, ahead of time. 
Um, and I really mean this. And I was thinking about this. Probably my favorite thing is how it has enabled me, like I'm going to get teary here in a second, how it's enabled me to um, rekindle this friendship with Caroline. I mean, I am so thankful. You know, she never mentored me or anything back when I was at her church years ago. I just would watch her and see her and she would have us over for dinner. And I taught her one of her boys to play the piano and things like that. But we were never close. Um, so walking away from this whole project, that's very meaningful to me. Um, the other thing also, the big joy of it was just honestly, the day we found out that Crossway wanted to publish our book. I mean, it was like, (laughs) I can't even explain to you the emotions that we had. It was just a wonderful day. I mean, this doesn't happen to us, right? What are we doing here? Um, But there we were. And that was such an exciting day. Um, I think uh, a couple of the challenging things, one was early on in the process coming um, to the point of how do we write with one voice? How are we two authors, but bringing this together into one voice so that it really reads well for the reader? Um, and uh, we were, were able to work that out pretty early in the process. I'm thankful. But like Caroline said, she mentioned the chapter on um, the greater grace, that chapter, and also the chapter on um, the truth that transforms where we are getting a little bit more into a, in a systematic theology sphere, how how would we do that, but make still make it very conversational? Right. And knowing that our readers could be someone who's at, who's our peer, but or someone who is maybe new to the faith or has not studied theology, how do we write this in such a way where someone who is well-grounded still is gleaning from it? And how do we write to it to someone who's not there yet and we're not over her head? Yeah. So finding that balance is a challenge, but it was, I think it was good for both of us because we really had to wrestle with what we believe and what we understand from scripture to be able to communicate it. And you did a great job with, with both of those things. Like the, the way that you have it where we can tell who's writing what, where you, you know, at the beginning you tell like me, Cheryl, me, Caroline, mm-hmm. this and that. I really love that because I'm, I'm an audible uh, person. So I have to listen. I, I got your book in Kindle and I had my phone, I had my phone read it to me. And so I love that because it, it made it so clear. Otherwise, I've got dyslexia. So if I was to just sit and read it, I would have been I would have been a little bit more confused. But it really did help it flow. And it wasn't like an awkward pausing or anything like that, which is always enjoyable to, to really be able to stay in the book and not be drawn out by uh, like uh, some books have the big title. This was so and so wrote this part and so and so wrote that. But you ladies kept it flowing really well. And I, I really appreciate that. And honestly, I'm so glad that you thought about who was going to be reading it. Because when I first got when I first got saved, I didn't know anything about Reformed theology. I thought I really did think that 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 was all just may, maybe too far over my I had something that I wasn't going to be able to understand. And then I started to try to learn it. All the big words, there are so many big words and and they're never ending. And when you finally learn some of them and you think you learn all of them, somebody else will pull out one with like 15 syllables in it. And you're like, that's not a real word. You made that up. And they're like, no, really, it's a real word. And, and it has five other words that sound just like it. And here are all the different reasons. But your book does a great job of bringing theology into it without watering it down. You didn't hold back any punches. You haven't softened any of this stuff in a way that makes it less biblical. You really, you really have the theology in there, but without making it so um, not studious because it is it is a, a wonderfully written book. Carolyn, you're right. The, the talent in this book is absolutely just beautiful. But there are theological books out there where every other word, I'm like, I got to stop and, and thesaurus this. So I don't even know. Um, the thesaurus is my favorite kind of dinosaur. I don't know what these words mean. So um, you did a great job. And I really appreciate that. Ladies constantly reach out to me about that. What do these words mean? And I'm like, look, don't be discouraged. Write them down. <laughs> Take it one word at a time. And eventually you'll forget them all. And But you'll know the theology behind them. So what was your goal whenever you were writing this? When you're writing when words, what words, sorry, when you're writing when words matter most, what were you hoping that readers were going to take away from it? Our main idea was that we wanted to, this was our little elevator pitch, but this is really, this puts it together. We wanted to encourage and equip women to speak the truth with grace to those they love according to their need. And so we, as you've mentioned, it's practical, right? So we wanted to make sure that we really gave women something to walk away with from each chapter that they could apply in their relationships, even that very day. Um, But we also wanted to encourage women that this is something that God has called you to do. And therefore, this is something that God will enable you to do. And that you don't need to be afraid of stepping into one another's lives with biblical truth. And uh, we just just tried to reiterate that in various ways throughout the book. Um, And of course, going into the speaking God's truth, that this isn't an issue of giving women my personal opinion and just loading them down with all of my practical advice. This is an issue of me stepping into someone's life with God's word 
word, his truth, his principles and helping them. But then according to your friend's need, and that's so important to really consider what is she dealing with? What is she going through? Have I listened well enough? Have I been invested in her life enough to understand what her struggle is so that when I do speak to her, I'm hitting the mark. I'm not out in left field somewhere, right. but I'm, I'm loving her by taking the time to understand her. And hopefully all those things came through, um, but there's the equipping and the encouraging to speak God's truth with grace. Definitely. That was good answer, you, Cheryl. <laughs> yeah, I'll just add, I can't add much to what Gerald said, but I want we want women to know the word. And as my husband says, ask the question, how thick is your Bible? So if somebody comes and asks you for help, what verses can you use? Right. You know, how much of the Bible do you know that answers questions and helps? So to encourage women to think, and I can use the Bible. It's ministered to me. I can tell that. But I can also learn different categories of help in Scripture. And that will help women minister to one another because I'm really, even though I'm in biblical counseling, I don't think there is a class system of these are the counselors, these are the women in the church. Right. Really trying to avoid that because we need women to help one another. And instead of thinking, and even pastors thinking, I need to send this woman to a counselor for help. It should be happening uh, dynamically within our churches. So that's why we are so heavy on scripture and so heavy on examples. Yeah, it does a fantastic job of that. And with the questions at the end, it really is set up really, really well to be used for a group setting or doing this together with maybe if you have younger women that you're discipling. It's it's set up really well for that. Do you recommend that for women for this to be used for women's groups or um, or just one-on-one -on -one discipling? And if so, how do you think it would be best used? Well, I love that question because, yes, that's why we put those questions at the end. <laughs> and uh it is hard to create questions that bring out what was in the chapter without repeating everything that was in the chapter, you know? So we even try to make our questions interactive. So as if you're sitting in a little group or with another person, it's like, well, can you, how do you apply Ephesians 4.29 to your life? Mm -hmm. So I'm actually teaching it to ladies in my church right now. So we we have a, like a big overview since each chapter is introduced by a verse. And I talk about that. And then we divide into little groups, like three or four, where we go through those. Because some of these questions are very personal, too. Yeah. Like, have you ever had this problem? And how how do you know anybody who has this problem? How do you minister to them? Yeah. So that's that's really been a blessing to my church to see women go through it that way in small groups. That's a great idea. How about you, Cheryl? How, how do you think this will be best used? I really agree with what Caroline said. And something that she mentioned just reminded me of this. When we were forming the questions, I was thinking back to um, when I've heard women say, oh, I don't want to do a book study because it's really not in the scriptures. And so when we formed these questions, I wanted to make sure that we really had questions in there where the women are going back into the scriptures for themselves so that nobody could say, oh, going through this, going through this as a little group, it's just, again, just throwing out our personal opinions. No, we're directing women back into the scriptures to think through the principles that were given in that chapter. Mm -hmm. So I, I think what she was saying is, you know, it can be used in a Bible study where they break down into small groups, you know, it really depends upon, you know, what a woman knows her, her particular dynamic is in her ministry. But yes, we do want women to be able to use this and encourage one another to do exactly um, what we're talking about. And um, another thought came to mind and it went right out. <laughs> <laughs> so That's maybe okay. it'll come back to me. We we have we call those squirrels and they're contagious. So I have yes. contagions upon you with all of my yes. random squirrels. I'm sorry. If it comes back to you though, let me know. And oh, then we'll okay. just edit and put it back. Oh good. Okay, go for it. Okay, the squirrel just came back. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of one of the things that really uh, if, uh, what's the word? Encouraged me, inspired me to go ahead and, and get started on the book is one day um, during a sermon, my pastor mentioned something just as an aside, he went on a tangent and he said something like this. He says, I've told younger men who are in this, who are in seminary or younger pastors that if you're going to write a book, write something for your local church. Mm -hmm. And if God ever chooses to do anything with that beyond your local church, so be it. And when I heard that, that was one of those other moments that made me think, this is something I want to share with the women of my local church. Mm -hmm. And um, now here we are with a book. But you know, at one point, Caroline was like, maybe we just self publish and we just use this with our ladies. Okay, but um, God had other plans for it. Yeah, Crossway. That's big. That's really exciting. How fun is that? Did you have to try? I'm sorry, this isn't on the list. But um, <clears throat> did you did you have to try multiple publishers whenever you were um, putting this out there? Yes, yeah. there was an there was another publisher that we had been in conversation with it with for several months. 
And we thought that was the way we were going. And um, several conversations, a lot of help, you know, encouragement along the way. And all of a sudden, one day we got a, a no. Oh. And that was a hard day. Yeah. And uh, we had to regroup, but it was the best thing for us because that regrouping process made all the difference in the world. Our, our husbands really said, keep going. You guys have something to say. So do it. We decided to do that. We found a freelance editor who uh, met with us on the phone and uh, she agreed to look over a couple chapters. And that sort of turned the corner for us. And then we started to see out various publishers and to make a long story short um we were able to work with crossway we like long stories on this episode on the show so you're fine okay. I, I kept Na- I, I kept professor nancy piercy on the program for four hours so um i'll try not to do that today because there's i have another i have another interview so you don't have there's, to worry i won't okay. do that you but um it's okay to have long stories, but I asked that because I know there every single author that I've had on the program, which I love to get to interview people who've written awesome books. They almost always tell me that same thing. And I hope it's encouraging for, for anyone listening who is in this process right now, because I can't even imagine how hard it is to be in this process, not knowing when this is just going, the process is going to be over and it's going to be able to be published. That's like, that's like the, the waiting moment. Like you're just, you're just in a limbo and you don't know where, like where it's going to go. And then to have somebody say, no, even if it's not, it's not personal. It's not like they're saying, hey, we don't like you personally. But, you know, publishers have quotas and they have all these different reasons for what they can publish, not publish. It's still hard, I'm sure. So I'm, I'm glad that you were able to tell that story just in case somebody's listening that that is currently in the middle of that struggle. Um, just having the opportunity to talk to so many different authors and even a Brooke, like, like we talked about before we started uh, recording, Brooke and I have had this conversation so many times because she has, you know, multiple book possibilities going on and, and publishing issues. And I'm like, man, I do not envy you. I'm over here complaining about editing podcasts. I don't, en- I don't envy people who have the talent of writing. But you ladies, I'm glad you persevered. And I am doubly thankful that Crossway chose this particular book because it, it is something that, that women's ministries, we all need. Do you think, this wasn't on the list either, I'm so sorry, but do you think that for men, w- would it be helpful for them, especially if they're leaders or elders or have wives and daughters for them to read some of this or go through it with their wives at any point? Is it is it written for that or is it just for women? We have had men leave reviews on Amazon saying, this is for men too. <laughs> Because scripture applies, right? Mm-hmm. It applies to all of us. So yeah, maybe our illustrations are using women, but it's still God's truth. And mm-hmm. All truth is God's truth. So we're glad to use it. Um, I'll uh, actually give you a verse oh, yeah. that says what we're trying to say. In First Thessalonians 2.12 says, We exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So that's what we're doing. And that's what men can do to one another. Husbands can do for their wives. So that verse applies to all genders, men and women. Yeah. And because you come at it with with this particular um, flavor, I, I, while I was reading it, I was like, maybe maybe if my husband were to read some of these chapters with me, he could better understand some of <laughs> where I'm coming from. Because it's so relatable. A lot of the stuff in here is relatable. And, and it's not always easy for my husband to relate to, you know, all the random women stuff that, and, and poor, the poor thing is he is outnumbered. He's the only man in the house. So <laughs> might be. Well, it's interesting. It's interesting. You mentioned that because uh, in our marketing meeting with Crossway, there were several people on that zoom call. And that was the first time we heard a man make that kind of comment about the book. Oh. One of the publicity marketing gentlemen, uh, an older man, I believe he said, you know, he says, I read this book and I thought to myself, wow, this is going to help me in my marriage. <laughs> And that was the first time. That was the first time we heard a gentleman talk like that. And like Caroline said, we've seen some reviews. Um, a couple of the endorsers they said the same thing. So yeah, it, it's it's written geared to women, but. Like Caroline said, the principles are still there for everyone. Yeah. And hopefully that'll help bridge the gap a little bit there because there is a communication gap. I can speak just for my own marriage, but there there is a little bit of a communication gap. Sometimes I say things and he hears something totally different and it, it is helpful. And, and also this is just a, a beautifully written and theologically sound book. So it is great, I think, for, for both sides. I'm glad I'm glad that I thought of that random question, even though I've, I didn't actually put it in the list. I'm so sorry. But in that line of reasoning to go back to actual questions that I actually warned you about ahead of time, um, there is is another form of where where people are maybe talking over one another or talking at one another rather than to one another. And that's just simply because sometimes people have varying personalities. We don't necessarily always jive. Maybe that's not the right word, but sometimes people will come across more abrasive. Other people will come across a little bit more sensitive. And it can be difficult for us as women whenever we're, where our goal should always be to love one another. It's one of the things that's really, really frustrating to watch women cut one another down in a group. Because when I, when I became fully reformed, I was like, everybody in the reformed community must be so gracious. Like Calvinist 
Jesus must be the most gracious people in the world because they believe in the doctrines of grace. And then I got here and I was like, oh, never mind. That's not actually how things work. <laughs> but we, we, you know, we should be really gracious to one another. And, and as moms and, and wives and even daughters, like we, we should even more so think, how can I make it easier and not harder for the other women who are struggling with things that I maybe will never struggle with or struggling with things that I, I am. And instead there's competition, there's backbiting, gossip, and, and really just misunderstandings. A lot of times whenever I have uh, the opportunity to talk to women who are in disagreement, it's not even really that they disagree with one another. They just don't understand what one another are saying. So what, how, how would you recommend we overcome just sort of battling personalities? I'm sorry for the gap. There. That's okay. <laughs> Up there, Caroline's motioning to me. Um, one of the things, as, as, you're, as you're explaining that, one of the things that first comes to mind is, as Christ said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so starting with an attitude of humility is absolutely essential in order to um, work through, through those types of conflicts and misunderstandings that can happen. And I know it's really easy for us to use the word humility. It's a lot easier. It's a lot harder to live it. Yeah. And um, as we speak about that in the book, in order to approach other women with graciousness, we must really understand the grace of God towards us ourselves. You know, you mentioned Reformed theology. Um, it's very easy to keep that at an academic level. Right. It's very easy. But we need to be praying and seeking to mature in Christ by really taking those things to heart and saying, you know what, this, this applies to me. I've been justified. That means I've been forgiven and I'm on an equal playing field with all these other women. We, we are all in the need and need of God's forgiveness because of Christ. We are no longer under, con we are no longer under condemnation. And that's all of us together in the church. And so there needs to be this element of saying, you know, I am not more important than you. I am not better than you. I am a sinner in need of grace, just like you are. And so approaching others with humility. And then even as we see God's grace in other areas of our lives, as he sanctifies us, that we really learn to be patient with one another. We are all a process in process. God is changing us to make us more like Christ. And that's true for every single one. And so being patient with others sin, being patient with other shortcomings, being patient with their weaknesses, just like Christ has been patient with us. Um, so that was what first came to mind as you were talking is just thinking about the heart issues. But the other thing that came to mind on a practical level is listening. We are so quick to respond instead of really listening. And when we listen, to listen for the purpose of understanding. I want to understand this other woman. Where is she coming from? Why does she think what she thinks? Why is she struggling? Thinking about this, I'm, I'm a pianist and so a musician by trade. And one of the things that I learned early on is that the rests, the moments of silence are just as important in a piano piece as the moments you are actually playing the notes. Yeah. To make it beautiful, you need sound and you need silence. And the same thing is true within a relationship within the church with, with, with a friend or with a woman you're ministering to. Yes, there's moments you need to speak, but there's moments you need to just be silent and listen. And um, it's just like music makes a beautiful performance. Uh, so I would say one of the things that women need to attain in order for those uh, those relationships to thrive and to work through those conflicts. That, that makes so much sense. I'm so glad that, that you explained that because it, it is it is really, really helpful. Caroline, do you have anything to add? Uh, great answer, Cheryl. Um, I'll just flesh out a little bit more about what we should be doing. In, we see it in Galatians 6, 2. We should bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So when I teach this to women, I say, you know, the law of Christ is love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. <laughs> so we bear each other's burdens. And that means I'm actually invested in you. I really am listening to what you're saying. And it's hard for us to uh, avoid projecting our own experiences into somebody right. like, oh, I've heard that story before. So here's the answer. Or I have experienced that. And this is what helped me. But for example, I sometimes talk to women who are cutting and well, what are your motivations? Well, those can be all over the place. It's not like there's an answer in one right. place. But the answer that we went to was Isaiah 53. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was wounded for iniquity. By his stripes, we are healed. That's that's the unifying principle, the work of Christ and how it applies to our problems. So that's why we encourage people as much as we can to, to elevate Christ in our conversations and rely on scripture instead of like whatever expert we might be learning from, which are really great expert, but we're, our purpose is to glorify the Lord in all things we do. Absolutely. That is so great. And I'm really, I was, I was like literally 
in my head, not out loud, because that would have been weird. I had headphones on. I was listening to your book. Nobody would know what I was doing, but I was cheering on the inside. Whenever I, I think I actually was listening to one of your interviews with uh, with David Knight, but you mentioned something about uh, asking questions whenever you're talking to. So you're listening, and rather than just responding, like you both said, you're asking asking questions to make sure that you fully understand. And I mean, I was like, I, I was literally like about to just just burst out with like cheers and joys because that's something that I've been I've been talking about on the program for so many years for so many years because I'll, when I first got saved, I had so many questions. And I was so confused about all these different theological issues. It was a process of getting all of that false theology out of my mind. And a lot of times whenever I would go to a a believer and I would say, hey, I'm confused about the, or just like you were mentioning, the doctrine of depravity. I'm confused. I don't understand. And they would take it offensively as if I was trying to argue against it, even though I was, I I was actually just like, no, I'm not, I'm not upset. I literally just don't understand. I honestly just start from the beginning and talk to me as if I was five. And then maybe I'll be able to understand. Uh, But a lot of times rather than asking me questions and trying to figure out where I was coming from, people would be, they would be on the defensive, probably because they had already been attacked on those theological issues. And here's this random person that's all like, hey, I have a question. I did find a few brothers in Christ who were willing to be patient <laughs> with me and bless bless them, my goodness, because the questions were nonstop for like three years. But it, it's so nice to hear y'all say that because that's what they did whenever I was asking a question. And I didn't even know how to formulate what I was asking about, because a lot of times it, it just is confusing to even say the whole sentence. They would just ask, well, what do you think about this first? Or have you read this chapter? Or how do you, you know, how do you feel whenever you listen to such and such? That Those kind of things. And it helped me not just figure out what I was thinking, but also process these things. So I'm really glad that you ladies have explained how to go about dealing with any of these folks coming to you, regardless of, and that's what's great about your book, is you deal with all of these different personalities, situations, issues. It's its absolutely fantastic. You could probably write like a whole another one doing like the same thing only with all different. I mean, you could do like a whole series because the, you did such a great job with these examples. I'm really, I'm glad that you explained that. Hopefully that'll be edifying for anybody listening, especially if somebody listening is dealing with someone who's like there, this person is just there grating on my nerves. And, and I don't know, I love Charles Spurgeon quote where he says, you think that I'm bad, but you don't really know how bad I actually am. So um, that's, that's really helpful. I'm so thankful for that. Now, what advice would you have on the opposite end of how to know not approach this? What what should we avoid whenever we're discussing these sorts of, of issues, when we're trying to speak truth in love? How should we not do that? I think you just touched on part of one of those things um, that's really important, and that's not to make assumptions about the other person. So we have to be careful, just like you're explaining, the, maybe they were assuming that you're wanting to be argumentative and you were just wanting to learn. Um, how often do we make assumptions about someone's motives or about how she really feels about something? Or maybe we think, well, she must have done this if that happened. Again, uh, asking those questions, drawing out, drawing her out. Um, and uh, another mistake that people um, can make, that we can make, is that we don't take the time, as we mentioned earlier, to really identify what is her problem. Mm-hmm. You know, first Thessalonians, it's a first or second Thessalonians 514. I just went blank. Um, first Caroline saying it's first, first Thessalonians 514. You already knew where you were going. <laughs> Admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak. We have to be very careful that we identify, is she the unruly? Is she the faint-hearted? Is she the spiritually or morally weak right now? Because let's say she's faint-hearted. You don't want to be admonishing her, right? right? And yeah. that can be so painful. I think we probably all know what it's like when we're dealing with something and we've gone to someone for help. And they've now addressed us wrongly in our situation. And now we feel misunderstood and it just sort of compounds the pain and the frustration. Um, Actually, I have a friend this morning who was even just telling me about something like that happened to her within the last couple of weeks where she was needing encouragement and someone rebuked her and uh, she had to really deal with that for a week. And then she realized, okay, I need to set that aside. She didn't understand where I was coming from. Well, we want to help women to avoid that. We want to avoid that kind of hurt, that kind of pain, that misunderstanding. So uh, we do spend some time really delving into identifying the faint hearted, the unruly, the weak, and then all those things of how, how does Paul say we were to respond to them. What does it mean to admonish? What does it mean to help? What does it mean to encourage? Um, and just giving women a road to walk down to do that well. Yep, absolutely. And you do a great job of going through each of those in this book. That's why I'm telling you ladies that you have to get this book. I'm telling you that it's fantastic. Caroline, what do you have? Do you have anything to add to that? I just want to give a scripture that supports what you're always saying. And that is Proverbs 20, verse 5. The purpose in a man's heart, or we could say, the purpose in a woman's heart is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. And you're talking about maybe dealing with a real quiet person, and she may have a really long rope. It takes a lot to draw her out. Or some like young girls I talk to, 
15, 16, 17 year olds who really aren't facilitate don't have much facility in language. I mean, you almost want to text them the question so they can <laughs> answer you. Yeah. <laughs> they might be the person like we need to really be a person of understanding to draw that person out. Yeah. Um, and you know what I would encourage our listeners to do also is to think where you fit in with her story. So we can tend to think of ourselves as experts and now we're coming in to fix you. But how many times have we been in that very position where we say, okay, I understand something of how you're feeling. So here's my story. So we don't want to project ourselves on people, but the way we can relate to them as a co- Christian as a co-pilgrim on the road is going to bring build those bridges between us. That's so helpful. I, I really I have to work on this because I, my exuberance sometimes when when somebody is like this is what's happening. Like, oh my goodness, I've gone through that five times. I can tell you all about it. And I have to just like be like, no, that's not helpful for anybody. And it would overwhelm me if somebody did it to me. So it is it is something that is really a struggle. That it's worth it. It's a struggle that's so worth it. Not just because then we end up with this deepening relationship where we can actually get into theology, which is which is my favorite conversation. Brooke and I constantly are saying to one another that we wish that there were more deep conversations about theology happening between women, that, that we could have these conversations, where, whereas instead it's it's a lot of fluff and stuff like that. And so it it molds into that. Like you start out listening and, and praying with one another. And then once you guys have gotten through these things together and you've built that sort of relationship, it's so, it's so much easier than to just be all like, and how about that doctrine of depravity? and go, you know, and, and just enjoy that fellowship. So I'm really glad that you ladies were able to answer all those questions. You did a fantastic job. But now I am afraid that I have to ask you something very serious, but not at all uh, uh, topically. I, I can't even think of the word. It has nothing to do with your book, but it's important. And I, I I hate to have to put everybody on the spot, but I tried. I did. I told you this in the email. I tried to let this drop. And, and I seriously, people started sending me pictures of themselves eating pineapple pizza whenever I tried to stop asking this question to my, my folks coming on to be interviewed. So I have to ask you this. I'm so sorry. But Ladies, do either one of you approve of pineapple on your pizzas? My husband loves it. So if he brings it home, I'll eat it. But I wouldn't order it. Carolyn, how about you? I'm not a big fan of pizza in general. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) I know. (laughs) Heresy. Yeah, I'm going to take that as two marks on my side. That's what I'm gonna <laughs> okay, is that, is that where you land? I'm yes, not I, a fan. Yeah. yeah. Oh, good. I'm, I'm, I'm like battling Lauren. the battle of it. The, the fight is on. It's dividing the church. So I'm trying to help sanctify okay. taste buds one person at a time. But yes, uh, we. Uh, my, I'm on the non-pineapple side and and I'm actually not very passionate about it, but I did try it on air live for everybody because this, this has been something that, that all of my listeners just won't leave me alone about. And I tried it on air and almost threw up on live air because oh, it, no. it was way too much pineapple. Everybody was like, that was a horrible slice. You should have tried a better slice. But I was like, well, I, I tried it. That's all that matters. I'm not doing it again. So all of the folks that come on, I ask, and, and it's fun to see everybody's different positions. I think Justin Peters and Phil Johnson both agreed it's blasphemy. Um, Ray Comfort told me to repent. So I mean, you know, you get you get different answers and whatnot yes. and it's fun, but I, I, I'm still loving the fact that both of you guys basically said it's it's not any good. Even even if you weren't as passionate as as I am, that's okay. I can win you over to my side in this fight, and and we'll just keep battling against those sinful taste buds. One, sanctification is a process, folks. We'll we'll get there. So uh, just getting back to actual serious stuff. This book was fantastic. You both mentioned that it, writing books wasn't something that you'd previously done, but there are articles, right? So we, we while we were discussing different things, you mentioned some articles. I'm going to try to link to any articles that you ladies have written that might have to do with this particular topic, not pineapple pizza, the actual topic of the episode, but. But is there any future projects that you ladies are going to be working on? Hopefully, maybe. Well, um, a couple things. Uh, just last week, I started working on a proposal for a second book. And so um, I um, have no idea how long this will take me. A lot of other responsibilities, but, you know, at least we're getting started. Yeah. And also, Caroline and I are giving some thought to actually putting together When Words Matter Most workshops or Words Matter workshops that would be available for churches. And so that's something that we're thinking through. And hopefully at the beginning of next year, we're going to have some information available for that. And Lord willing, that will be a road we go down for a while. So how neat. Let me know whenever you guys get that all out there and launched. And I'll I'll make sure to advertise and let all the ladies know all the different folks listening. Yeah, absolutely. That's very exciting. I have one last question for you, wonderful ladies, and then I will let you go. Uh, How can we be praying for you? My listeners and I love to join together to pray for anyone coming on the program. So how can we be praying for you both? My prayer is a little bit serious because I've seen so much fluff out there and uh, it's really, we don't want to be in a category of teaching or writing anything that's not accurate because those who teach will be judged with the stricter judgment, James 3 1. But also, um, we want to rightly handle the word of truth. So yeah. we really need prayer to be able to endure 
to cross the finish line with accurate and stable, biblically informed theology. All right. We'll be praying for that for sure. Cheryl, how about you? And just to add to that, I'll ditto everything she just said, and particularly applying to um, this process of us thinking through uh, the workshops for churches and also with the new book that I'll be working on. Um, So staying faithful to scripture and doing that in such a way where it is helpful to the church. We really believe in the local church, and so we want to support the local church. Um, But secondly, just the stage of life that I'm at or that I am in. I have a 22-year-old and two 16-year-olds. My 22-year-old is now engaged. And so just this new stage of life with the kids getting older, just that I would um, be wise with them, be a good mom, you know, still encourage them in their walks with the Lord. Um, I can always use prayer for that. Absolutely. We definitely will. Thank you both so much for this book. Everybody listening, there are links to these two ladies' ministries and anything that you have. I know uh, there's websites and social media, but are you both on social media? Yes, there is. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I found links, but I wanted to make sure that that I had everything. So if there's anything specific that you want me to make sure to highlight, I can uh, add it into the descriptions. But other than that, I'll link to the book and all of y'all social. I, I think I saw a bunch of like the different links. So I'm probably just going to snag them from right. David Knight's episode because mm-hmm. okay. he's already got we, we can We can send you everything that you need and, and the article links and all that too. Oh, great. Great. Okay. I'm very excited about that. You would not believe how many times women are like, can I have some more information though? And I'm like, I don't know. Um, and you already had it. So it's really exciting. And I think I'm so thankful for both of you ladies and for the time that you gave me. Please keep me updated if there's anything that I can do to help support your book or any of the other projects you have going on. I definitely Definitely. I'm, I'm thrilled to do it. I'm just very thankful that there's another book that I can I could recommend to, to women. So I'll be doing a book giveaway for your book around the same time that the review comes out so that okay. I can kind of garner some back and forth for the episode too. So I will, um, if you'd like, I can send you a link whenever the episode yes, is ready. Definitely. Okay. And the thank review you. and just, yeah, just keep us posted on what you're doing. And we appreciate this so very much. So yes. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Well, God bless each of you ladies. I look forward to seeing what you're both working on in the, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, Humblebees. I hope that that discussion was edifying. Again, that is the book, When Words Matter Most, Speaking Truth with Grace to Those You Love. I think this is a super important book. I do recommend you all get it. I am very excited to see such a theologically sound book that is also applicable and personable and just, just a really, really great book. The gospel is in it. There are so many things in there to admonish and encourage and edify you. So I do recommend this book. I also recommend that you find and follow these wonderful ladies on their social medias or their website, which the links to I have provided in the descriptions down below so that you can find them if you would like that. And also in case you were wondering, we have switched over to instead of mega live lists on Friday, we are now doing it on Thursdays because I asked and you answered and that was the day that was uh, preferred. So we're now doing live events on Thursday. If you don't know what that means because you are a podcast listener, which most of you are, that is over on the YouTube channel. So even if you're a podcast listener, go ahead and hit subscribe to my YouTube channel, which is a link down in the descriptions below. If you are a podcast listener, there should be a link down there for you. And that way you will never miss a live event because each week I do try to go live where I can answer your questions and may, maybe every now and then uh, we, we do talk a little bit every now and then about Oreos sometimes just every now and then um, just kidding it's an obsession I have absolutely no idea why we talk about theological stuff and recommendations prayer requests all that good stuff so you can find that over on the YouTube page the Tulips and Honey YouTube page also if you are listening and you want to leave a review I have heard that apparently that's a good thing and that I'm supposed to be recommending it so if you wanted to leave reviews for the podcast that would be great please do also leave a review once you have read this book because reviews to help authors. And so that's a point of encouragement and also helps get the word out about these fantastic books. And that's it. That's all I have for you, wonderful humblebees. I love you all and I'll talk to you later. Bye. Thank you for listening or watching this episode of the Tulips and Honey Show. We trust that you were helped and edified by this episode by either watching or listening to it. For more great content like this, please consider subscribing on your favorite podcast catcher so together we can magnify the name of the Lord, see his church strengthened, his people encouraged, and the lost reached with the gospel of Jesus. I think that diamond still needs a little more polish. Yeah. (laughs) 